I am self-conservative. Rationalized in my head, these are things I read. And I'm going to talk about Willow Creek. Okay. Uh, Willow Creek, a few years back, had invited... I remember at the time when Will Rogers said, I, I don't belong to any organized religion, I'm a Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> I am self-conservative. If you didn't jump to conclusions, you might not get any exercise. I am self-conservative. And welcome to the Unknown Webcast. This is just a bit of a trigger warning for those who believe words are more injurious than sticks and stones. I really am so conservative, I can't turn left even when I'm driving. In addition to giving trigger warnings to our viewers, Ron Hensel and I both drink coffee for your protection. This week, Salvador I'm on sorry. Hayworth. I started uh, started sharing too early. What are you doing, doing here? I accidentally started sharing. <laughs> okay. okay, this week, this week, Salvador. <laughs> uh, um, Hayworth joins us to talk about walking with the dead in South Africa. My name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast, and our senior researcher who likes to tinker in the background when I'm trying I do, I do. to will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast, and here is Ronnie Baby. Greetings from sunny Florida. Well, you know what? They changed the share interface a couple of weeks ago, and I'm still getting used to it, and I made a mistake. So, um, we, But tell me, why are we always spending all of our time warning triggers here? I don't get it. So, okay. Well, anyways, greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm tree caught, came out, saw its shadow. And now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsor for this edition of the Unknown Webcast is... The Coexist Boutique for when you care enough to take your hands off your loved one's throats long enough to pick out the perfect gift. The Coexist Boutique. Our regular legal disclaimer, if I click it five times, will it turn? Yes. Okay. Our guest on today's webcast, insert name here, that's Salvador Ung Hayworth. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yep. Thank you. Has no connection whatsoever to any of the satirical content of the Unknown Webcast, hereafter known as the Webcast, although we probably will not mention it again. The satirical content includes any and all end credits, commercials, puns, smart remarks, or anything else that might fall under the definition of satire. In the meantime, Midwest Christian Outreach Inc. bears no liability for or responsibility for anyone's opinions regarding this satirical content. Our regular notice, the opinions on this webcast are ours and should be yours too if you enjoy it or if it really annoys you and you want to inflict it on someone else to ensure your continued access please go to midwestoutreach.org click the yellow donate button and contribute as you feel led and as you do never fear this webcast is y2k compliant and don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite video channels and now our guest salvador ung hayworth Okay, I did click that like three times. Okay, it's going to eventually turn. Okay, well, anyways, I'm just going to... Oh, here we go. Finally. <laughs> three games. I... Did it stop? We had, we had it stop? Four I don't know what's going on. Yeah, they're, they're coming, though. These are very fickle people. So... Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I had to reboot my machine, and uh, apparently it still has issues. So We don't care greetings. what your personal problems are today. Frank. I know. Nobody does. Nobody cares. I'm a victim. <laughs> I, I, I actually just tried to close out the share window. It's still uh, – my PowerPoint is yeah, – yeah. there's a delay. You know, so, one of the things we were, we were talking about just before we went live, uh, Ron and I – get to meet kind of some very interesting people along the way in our life. I uh, uh, go to uh, venues where pagans are hanging out, like Paganicon 2023, you have a thousand uh, witches, druids, Wiccans, uh, Satanists, all in one location, and they'll talk to me. It's kind of really fun. Uh, or the Parliament of the World's Religions, and so I get to do that. Then we did an article a while back on hashtag BLM, uh, which is uh, a religion that actually hails from West Africa. 
uh, and has made it its way across when this with the slave trade across the planet, basically in various uh, forms. And uh, one of the individuals that was involved with that contacted. Uh, actually, she did an article and linked to mine, and I contacted her, and she has has been from Brazil, so she was practicing the same thing. Now. Not too long ago, maybe two months ago, I think, I came across some stuff that you were doing, and I thought, well, that looks interesting. Salvador Ong is in South Africa. Uh, you yeah. weren't born there. You hail from New Zealand, right? I was born in Portugal, grew up in the UK. My wife is from New Zealand. Okay. <laughs> so you really are an international kind of a guy. <laughs> yeah, cosmopolitan. And so you are with KwaZulu Mission, and you've made two videos, which I am. Are, we have links to them in the description. You want to watch both of them. One of them, which we won't talk about a lot today, we'll just mention it, is called Seeds of Faith. And it is an export of American heresy and British, uh, I believe, uh, or German, maybe German, uh, uh, from German descent, to South Africa. Uh, word faith movement. The other one is called Allegiance, Walking with the Dead. Now, when I was in business, I had I had employees that kind of might fit that description, sort of. No, not exactly. Uh, but uh, you are at uh, ministry to in in uh, South Africa, KwaZulu Mission. Tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got involved, and what you've been doing the last few years or so. Right. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Um, so I first came to South Africa in 2002. I came on a study permit for a year and that mm -hmm. turned into two, almost three years. Um, ended up in a Zulu area um, called um, Kambi Tribal mm -hmm. Area and um, went back to the UK, came back to South Africa in 2006 and my heart was still there and met my wife in 2007. We got married and then in 2009 we moved to that area and we built a home in a Zulu, Zulu homestead. Um, they call it Umwuzi. So it's a, basically a home with lots of houses in it and then a cattle crawl um, where you put your cattle. And so um, we were there for seven years and then we went to a church on the coast um, for about a year and a bit. And then we were in New Zealand and now we're back in South Africa but this time we're helping to establish a church here in Kokstadt, which is predominantly white people. But I go out every Saturday morning, or I try to, and um, street preach, hand out tracts, mm -hmm. engage with people. And it looks like we might be starting a, a monthly Bible study in a, mm -hmm. a, a amongst the Kosa people in um, a place called Mount Alef. So there's a, a couple of families there that are not really part of a church at the moment. So Kokstadt's kind of a melting pot of the Kosa and the Zulu and some Sutu, and then you have English Afrikaans and some Indian. So it's a bit of a mix. Wow, wow. So just out of curiosity, it's not anything to do with what we're going to be talking about in a minute, but just because I'm interested, how many languages do you speak? Uh, I speak um, Isizulu. Um, I've learned some Isikosa words. So Isikosa and Isizulu are very, very related. Yeah. So a bit like the closer than Spanish and Portuguese. So say that again. Um, sorry? It's the words that you said with the clicking sounds. Oh, yeah. They're in both languages. So they're both in Guni languages. It's a branch of language, a Bantu language in South Africa. And then you, I can speak some Hebrew. I'm, I'm, I'm learning Hebrew. I continue to learn Hebrew. Modern, My Hebrew modern Hebrew. You mean modern, modern Hebrew? Hebrew, but also I did biblical Hebrew as well. Um, so I read the Bible, but I still need glosses. So um, I had a professor. Well, some form of English. One of my, <laughs> one of my Bible and then college. You pick up phrases in other languages as well. Like I, I did do Spanish at college, and um, but I forgot a little bit of much of the Espanol. Poco um, poquito. Um, <laughs> a few phrases in other languages. Yeah, I, I had a Bible college professor. His name was uh, Ken Fleming, and he was a missionary to South Africa until the late seventies when he came to the Bible college where I was, uh, you know, attending and as a missions professor. And he started speaking in 
one of those Zulu tongues you just used and the clicking sounds that I remember hearing those first in 1977. And uh, he was, uh, he's the brother of Peter Fleming, who was mm. yes, one of the Alka, uh, one of the missionaries to Ecuador who, who died. And uh, so that was fun to, to get to hear that. And then of course, I, one of my favorite singing groups is Lady Smith Black Mambozo. Mm. So you yeah. hear it, you know, when they sing. And, and then I've listened to other African uh, singing groups and it's fun. I, I love hearing it. So yeah. Tongue Especially twisters music. are funny. Yeah. <laughs> like in English, she sells seashells on the seashore and it's yeah. usually Kaba no Kulu Bakokanama Koko, which means <laughs> and Kulu to people okay. are chatting with frogs. <laughs> so wow. that's funny. Wow. So that's cool. Yeah. I like that. Okay, so um now this is interesting because we're mm. talking about walking with the dead. I want you to explain what you mean by that allegiance walking with the dead so that people might get a little more intrigued as I, as I mentioned this uh, individual who was with uh, uh, a version of Odu Ifa uh, I sent her your video as well she loved it and she saw the same thing that I did that uh, uh, although and, and she was demonically possessed herself prior to coming to the faith and she saw the same thing that I did, which is a faithful teaching of the word of God tended, and I'm not saying every single time it works this way, but tended to be what was needed to deal with the demonic spirits. So let's start with one. What is it that the, that the Zulus believe is happening with these entities? And what do we think they actually are from a biblical standpoint? Right. So, um, this is, when we talk about Zulu, it's pretty much across the board. It's African traditional religion. And the idea is that when you die, you don't, um, you're not disconnected from the living, and you're not really seen as dead and gone. You're seen as living dead. And so, to enable the welfare of the home and the family to continue, you have to do certain rituals to connect the dead to the living. Um, so that can be various different rituals. Um, one of them, which comes up in the film, is they'll take a baby and they'll take them to a sangoma. And a sangoma is a diviner. They're, they're connected to the spirit world and they can um, give information from the dead, a bit like a medium. And the isangoma diagnoses problems. So if you, 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 you're, you're sick and you can't explain why, and you, you, medicine hasn't helped, you kind of think, well, maybe it's a spiritual problem. So you go to an Isangoma and the Isangoma um, divines what the issue is and they tell you what you need to do. So for uh, a lot of white South Africans, they call Isangomas witch doctors, which is rejected by um, black South Africans by and large who are really into this. They see ancestors and witchcraft as two different things. Okay. So witchcraft is what you do to harm people. And this is um, a lot of Sangomas, they would say they're helping people, so they're not doing witchcraft. So it's a bit like the distinction between white magic and black magic. Okay, so that's interesting because here, for example, Wicca is uh, on the increase, uh, mm. one of the fastest growing religions in the U.S. currently. And many of them make take the same exception. We're not doing something evil because our one thing we all agree on is harm none do as you will so anything we do must not harm somebody those who are doing harmful things are uh satanists and others who may be casting evil spells yeah so you're kind of running the same thing with uh with the africans well, that's in the, the mindset and that's the way people see things so you actually have to take that slowly and have to kind of just turn to scripture and say god's regarding ancestors and witchcraft in the same category so um if you look at um leviticus 19 verse 31 in it says so it says you shall not repent towards those who have ancestral spirits and neither to witchcraft people so it's it's saying ancestors and witchcraft and that comes up 
often in the Zulu Bible, chapter 20, verse 6 is another one. So God puts them in the same category. And that's the kind of approach that I take with people. I do acknowledge you don't believe they're the same, <laughs> but what does God think about it? So you kind of, you can't just kind of jump in and say, no, you, you, your, your ancestors are demons. I mean, you can, but you probably <laughs> won't get too far because in their minds, the, those spirits are their lost loved ones. So now you're calling their aunt and their uncle a demon. And first, for me, I feel like you have to establish that these are not your lost loved ones. They're spirits pretending to be. And um, in South Africa, it becomes a little bit easier with a number of people to do that because they do um, regard the Bible as a holy book. So now you've got a platform of authority to go to, and I prefer to let them read it in their own language. But you so, kind of have to so you don't have to, unlike we have to do here currently, yeah. you don't have to establish that it is a holy book or the word of God. They already embrace that. They just don't understand what it says. Um, quite a number of people, yes. You'll find there are people who'd say, but um, the Bible was written by men. So there is, you do have to engage in apologetics to defend the Bible. But um, you do have a strong platform there with a lot of people because they go to churches that use the Bible. Like I was speaking to someone on Saturday and he says he goes to these different churches and he hears what they say. And there's one that says you need to follow God and ancestors. And I said to him, OK, on what basis do they teach you? And he said, well, they, they're reading the Bible. I said, well, why are they reading the Bible? Why are they not reading the Quran or the, uh, the Bhagavad Gita or can't even pronounce it and um, other religious books. And he said, because the Bible is the word of God. And so then I turn and I say, so what does the Bible say here? So it's like a step-by-step -step approach um, to it. But the thing is, you always got in your mind that, that for there's a fear aspect in this because the ancestors or the, in Isisu, they call them Amaklozi. They're the ones that protect us. They, they care for us. They chase away the evil. And in kind of a, I would say across the board, across the world, but in black Africa, there's a mindset that if something benefits your life, it must be from God. So uh, I remember driving, um, I, was, I was driving, we call it Bucky here, you call it pickup truck over a field because I didn't want to take the long way round. And so I drove over and sliced the tire on a rock oh. and it just went flat. And um, our friend, um, she's actually in the film um, she's never acted before and she plays Hamilton's mum, and she was phenomenal. And she just said, ah, Satan, like this. And I said to her, why are you saying Satan? Why is it not, <laughs> why is it not just my stupidity? Like, it's, it's kind of like <laughs> we're programmed to think the benef beneficial things or what I think is beneficial must be right. And that which seems to bring me harm and suffering must not be from God. So that mindset is there in Pentecostal charismatic Christianity, and it's there in Black Africa, which is why we did the two films. And um, they, they actually correlate in terms of worldview. Um, and the, the films actually began because um, we had our friend in the, he's in both films, his name's Majuru. He's from Zimbabwe. And he came to Freyek where we were, and we were visiting our friend's home, and there was an Afrikaans lady there and she was really into word of faith and um, Majuru was countering it. He came out of that thing. And then when we left, we heard that this lady said that Majuru is from the devil. So, uh, so later um, I asked the local independent Baptist pastor, would you like to have this guy share his story coming out of ancestors? And um, he said, that would be great. It would give people an understanding of what people are going through in trying to reach them. And um, he shared his t story and this lady turned up and she thought it was he was phenomenal because she didn't remember it's the same person. And um, in as he was speaking, he was saying African worldview and culture, we believe that the physical world and the spiritual world are completely interconnected. And therefore, when things happen to you, there's a spiritual reason behind it. So he actually shared about when his brother got murdered, someone shot him, and the father, who was a medium, so he's not a sangoma, he's not a diviner, he's a channeler for the spirit of the ancestor. He becomes the ancestor in the space. And so 
he turned around to the family and said, we need to know what happened to my son. And Majuri put his hand up and they said, um, he said, what have you got to say? And he says, I know how my brother died. And the father says, how do you know? And he says, someone picked up a gun and shot him. And he was basically saying, there's no spiritual reason behind that. It's just what happened. What happened is what happened. And he said, then I came into the church and it was the same thing. You've got a curse on your life. That's why all these bad things are happening to you. You've got a curse in your generational line. And um, so he, he shared all these things. You know, if you're in um, in a, a particular malady and you, you're, you're sick and it's inexplicable and you go to the Sangoma and they diagnose the problem, maybe they send you to an Inyanga, which is a medicine man or a medicine woman, and they give you Muti, which is medicine. And that medicine, you can apply it to yourself. You can apply it to your home. Um, to chase away the evil. He said, then I came into the church and it was the same thing. You've got a pro problem. You go up to the prophet, you give them money, they give you the anointing oil. It's the same thing. So that basically what brought the idea in my mind about doing the two films, because when you share people's stories, you actually can connect, you enter into their world, and then you can actually kind of understand where they're coming from because this thing of ancestors is actually and word of faith they're very much strongholds in people's hearts and minds and especially when you have been helped by these things you have an emotional attachment to them so i kind of thought well it'd be good if people watch these films and gain an emotional attachment to the people telling their stories because if they believe in these things of ancestors or word of faith it might make people question and it might make people think. And so um, that's a long story to explain how well, um, the films came yeah, about. I, I want to bring up because uh, uh, Ivani Greppi is her name. She's Brazilian, uh, was a former Umbanda medium, which is a form of Yoruba Ifa. Now, I go, that's kind of a long way to get to a different point because in the US, at least, many do not realize that hashtag BLM is a religion using um, politics and race to gain new members. And one of the things they do, you'll identify with this, is before they do a protest, they do several rituals and they're calling out names during the rituals. Now, the average person thinks they're just calling the names of people who have died. Well, in a sense, that's true. What they're doing is calling on the spirits of those people to come in and dwell and empower them to carry out the work. Is that kind of similar to what you're talking about there? Yeah. So if you have to move to another place, um, you, like if you're deeply into ancestors, uh, some people are not deeply in. They do it because they were conforming to the family and the expectations of the family. African culture is very communal oriented. And so it's your identity is not in your in your what you think you are and what you feel you are it's in your roots it's in your blood it's in your family it's rooted to the earth and so um that's why you won't see that much transgenderism in south Af in, in africa you do see it a little bit in south africa but not too much but african by and large i mean you know a man is a man and a woman is a woman and also homosexuality i think blm aren't they pro homosexual yeah, they are but African cultures against um, the validity of long-term same-sex relationships, because if they're engaged in, they most by and large throughout Africa, the examples of homosexuality were seasonal, you know, except for the king of the Buganda people, he basically had relationships with boys and girls in his court. But um, those boys who he had a relationship would go and marry women and they would have families. And so the whole purpose of that and the whole reason why homosexuality is not a valid form of long term relationship is that you actually need to have a heterosexual relationship to have children so that when you die, your children will remember you. So this whole BLM thing, I think, might be a little bit selective in yeah. what they pick from African culture. <laughs> and also the West, like CNN, don't understand the African argument when they say this is not an African thing. They're right. missing this whole aspect of ancestors that undergirds that. So if you think about going back to cultural identity, your identities in your birth group, it, you, your, you, your roots are important and history 
in a sense, or the, the traditions are more important than um, progression, although that's not true, like in Zimbabwe, there's a lot of people who are looking forward and wanting to get on with their lives. But I think with um, the, the, the kind of collectivism, um, it's not really rooted, it might find an affinity with communism, but it's not rooted in communism, it's rooted in this whole thing of ancestors. Right. And so now, this, part, this is the name, you're, you're, you're aware of who this person is, right? Yeah, he's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Miguel. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so, so it's very okay. difficult for people to break away because the your identities in your family and your family will be against you. And so what we, you know, in the West, sometimes when we have an argument with our family, it's like, well, it's your problem and uh, I'm going to do what I want to do. The, the, the person who's steeped in the culture feels that alienation and that um, sense of opposition very acutely. And that's also something to understand when you witness the people who are from that background. So, okay, that gives me another question. Uh... I just had it and I hate it. It just it just evaporated from my brain. I hate it when I hate it. The evaporation occurs. Okay. Uh, oh, Bill Gothard, who you don't have any familiarity with, probably. Uh, one of the today. things that he would do is we we met with him for about six years to correct his bad authoritarianism teaching. Ended up writing a book about him. One of the things, though, because he was very into ancestral demons you have problems in your life because of ancestral demons and also that demons attach themselves to uh, physical objects and so you could mistakenly bring a demon into your place of business because it's attached to this physical object now i i do not believe that's biblical at all if uh, if that were true when uh, Paul was dealing with meat sacrifice to idols. He would have said, don't eat the meat because you might ingest a demon yeah. in the process. He didn't really do that. And so he will then tell a story of a guy who was in Africa. Uh, he purchased a mask when he was there. He brought it home. He put it up in his office wall. He loved it. He thought it was a great piece of art. Uh, and then uh, shortly after his return, his business started de going into decline. And uh, so he was uh, talked to Bill to try to figure out what it might be. And uh, Bill uh, noticed the mask there. And he said, well, you have brought a demon into your home. And the demon is causing your business to go down. And so they took it out and burned it. Now, he's using, he's looking for some spiritual causality. It could just be the economy was bad. Yeah, and I like the word could because... You know, there's certain times where, you know, if you're getting engaged in things that are actually um, actually occultic, then, you know, the Lord may well chastise. Um, the Lord may well discipline um, because, you know, he loves us and he wants to correct us. Um, but, you know, what it comes to, I think, with these kind of circles is everything starts to be looked at that way. And so you start to see every African mask well, it must be connected to ancestors, but you'd actually have to look and see, is it or is it decorative? You know, what is the context behind this? I've heard music that's to ancestors that um, doesn't, it's not like jarring music. It's not like heavy metal. It's very melodic and very nice lullaby style music. And it was in the description, this was for ancestors. It was with the uh, African piano, the Mbira, I forgot what um, else it's called, but it's that one with the little metal keys and you play it. Um, it was beautiful music, but that's given to ancestors. So like people, I think when you see something African or Chinese, it, it's very easy to jump to conclusions when you're coming from a place of ignorance and yes, very right. superstitions. Well, one, one of the discussions that we had, and, and I'm glad that Ron brought up this group was uh, Lady Bird. I, I just, I love their stuff. Lady well. Smith. Pardon? Lady Smith. Lady Smith, yeah, Lady, Smith. yeah, Lady Bird was the president. Of <laughs> yeah, one of our first ladies. <laughs> yeah, but uh, 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 Gothard uh, has this idea, and others kind of followed suit that uh, music uh, is can be demonic, and so anything with a rock beat is demonic, and anything literally from Africa is demonic because it has a different kind of a beat than he likes, for example. 
Mm. And so one of the things that I, I mentioned to him when he was going on about this, well, there's several things we had a discussion, but one was this. Are you saying, just so I understand, that the only truly godly music was written by dead white guys 300 years ago? Mm. <clears throat> Can't it be that other cultures can have truly God-honoring music even though you don't like the beat and the movement and the all those sorts of things? And he just was dumbfounded. He couldn't understand how that could be holy. But again, it's coming from a place of ignorance. If you if you come to a culture and everything's different, you automatically ask the question, why do you do this and why are you doing this and why are you doing that? Um, because it feels alien. So there's an automatic suspicion there. But like my friend Majuru, I was actually part of his Labola negotiating team <laughs> when he remarried after his first wife died. And um, and he had his brother at the wedding playing Mbira. Um, and the Mbira there, this brother plays Mbira for ancestors, but at the wedding, he played non-ancestral music. He played secular Zimbabwean music. So not all music is rooted in rituals. The right. music is used for different purposes. <clears throat> now, if you're coming from a place of ignorance, I treat it like the meat sacrificed to idols. Paul says, don't ask questions. But if someone says to you, this is offered to an idol, don't take it, not for your own conscience, but for that person's conscience. But then two chapters later, in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, Paul then is, cha is challenging people who, for their business relationships, they're going to the temple with their um, um, collegiate group, their, um, their trade guild. And um, there's sacrifices offered to the gods of that trade guild in the temple. And Paul challenges them and he says, you can't take the table of demons and the table of the Lord. But what he doesn't argue is, because if you take of the table of demons, you're opening a doorway and allowing the demons to plague you. He actually says you provoke the Lord to jealousy. So the whole focus of Paul's instruction there is not actually about the demonic, it's about the Lord. And the Lord, again, may well chastise us, but that doesn't mean that every bad thing that's happening to us is a chastisement or is down to some doorway being opened or is because you've done something wrong. And I think that's the whole thing of Job, you know, the theology in Job is sometimes the innocent suffer and because we live in a fallen world and a broken world. Right, right. And and, and something I appreciate you just said, and, and Ron and I uh, keep coming back to this ourselves, mm -hmm. is everything in Scripture really is about Christ. It's about the oh. Lord. That's the is, is his story. And, and too many today, at least in Western culture, view the Bible as their individual personal story in which they're the main character and God is sort of the supporting actor. But yeah. that's not it. God is no. the main character. We get we yeah. get to join in his play, but it's his play. Yeah. Now, so what do you happen, though, if you are right. in, a, in a family situation where you're going to, you know, you have to get together with others who don't believe exactly what you believe, and you have to choose what sort of thing to take to the event? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We have a sponsor who speaks to that question. Do you struggle with finding the right wine to bring to your cousin's pagan goat sacrifices? Do you wonder what to wear to your neighbor's neo-Nazi parties? Do you get anxiety attacks when trying to find the right picket signs to share with your friends from Westboro Baptist Church? Well, now you can say you're canceled to the uncertainty of celebrating special occasions with loved ones on opposite sides of the culture wars. I misspelled sides there. Did you, did you catch that? Because you can find the perfect gift for any ideology at the Coexist Boutique. This week's special deal in honor of the 50th anniversary of Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution relive the days when university students subjected their professors to public shaming sessions in which they would break their eyeglasses and publicly rebuke them at great length for not exhibiting politically correct opinions and behaviors. Oh, wait, that's going on right now in the USA. This week's special deal, cultural revolution eyewear, genuine smashed Chinese prescription lenses and frames formerly owned by PhDs and university administrators dating back to 1966 to 1976, the years of the Cultural Revolution, only 99 cents a pair at 
the coexist boutique for when you care enough to take your hands off your loved one's throats long enough to pick out the perfect gift. Do come back and make your purchases. We mm -hmm. take all major credit cards. So thank you for that. We're back. I should put applause at the end of each commercial, right? <laughs> Well, Nobody well, seems to know what to say, so yeah. let's have applause. So that does that brings up some interesting to me some interesting ideas in your area of mission work. I know when I it, our group goes to some of these uh, events like Paganicon, we have to start off with uh, a particular question in almost every setting, which is, "What is it that you believe, and what attracted you to it?" Uh -huh. Because most of them were not born into it. They opted for some form of pagan belief system. Uh, <clears throat> how, how do you even begin that kind of a discussion? Because you're you're talking with a pe group of people who generally already accept that the Bible is God's word, even though they may not understand it. That's interesting. Yeah, and that's I think what you did was really good because you basically getting them to share um, from their own perspective what they think what they believe because everybody's different some people might be quite similar and yet have differences so you kind of have to kind of engage with a person where they're at and not kind of assume well this person believes this because of this um with um people involved in ancestors yeah generally it's because you're born into it and um, that's where you're raised so i had one guy one year and he said in my mother's womb I was a Zionist. And so the Zionists actually started in the state, Zion City, John Nelson Darby, not John Nelson Darby, um, let's say Dowie, Alexander Dowie. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a different oh, issue. Real? Okay, yeah. So <laughs> I, I, is right there. I live right here. Yeah. So, he was, so you deal with them. Well, he's, what happened in the States is he was taken over and asked out by WG Believer. And then under him, missionaries were sent to Africa and a guy, I've forgotten the year, but a guy called Daniel Bryant baptized the first 27 converts in um, Johannesburg. And so Zionism started in South Africa wow. and it was pretty much white. I think at that stage it was white to lead. It was, um, I think most people who are involved in Zionism in South Africa don't really know it's actually a white church that's imported into South Africa. And initially, um, they'd be against witchcraft and they'd be against ancestors. So what would happen is say a Sangoma, she's like, wants to join the church. She gets rid of everything, but then she becomes a prophet. <laughs> so, so instead of being, you see, when you're a Zulu and you, and you kind of going into being a Sangoma, you don't choose to be a Sangoma. You were called. So you experience certain phenomenon, which in Isisu is called ukutwasa. So maybe you're inexplicably, inexplicably ill and you may be sweating profusely. You have these things that are irrationally happening in your body and nothing can help you. And then you go to a Sangoma to find out. And the Sangoma says the ancestors are calling this one to be a Sangoma. And then they need to go and learn from another Sangoma. And through that, eventually they do some kind of testing and an initiation. And it, it, from the literature I've read, when you go through that initiation, the Idrozi, the ancestral spirit comes into you and possesses you. And so leaving that aside, what they then say in the um, Zionist church is, I'm being called by Isitunua, which is a sent prophesying spirit by the Holy Spirit who is calling you and you have to learn and go through initiation, and then the Isitunua comes inside of you. So it's basically the same thing, but different terminology. Now, over time, the churches became separate from the original <clears throat> leaders, and they governed themselves, and over time, it slipped. So uh, Zionism in South Africa is pretty um, um, syncretistic. So it's African traditional religion mixed with things of the Bible. And there's a very much an emphasis on prophecy and prayer and not so much on doctrine. So, um, you know, you want to evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. And as you're in the meeting, you might make some sounds that would or, or noises that would really show that you are filled with the spirit like you or, you know, and it's kind of it's kind of 
it's not chaotic, but it's um, uh, um, it's very charismatic in that sense. Oh. You're trying to well, and so, so what you describe is kind of interesting. Is I, I uh, uh, has, has spoken a couple of times at uh, uh, what was called the Catholic Christian Church in Zion. It was John yeah. Alexander Dowie's church. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that they were sharing with me as they talk about the history is that there are tribes in Africa that only receive missionaries from that church, not anybody yeah. else. Uh, yeah. and, and so they're trying to correct this stuff. Second thing is Alexander Dowie, which many don't realize is really the kind of the father of modern day Pentecostalism. Nearly all of the main figures in Pentecostalism in the U.S. in the early 1900s had been trained by him. So... <laughs> Yeah, he also was in Australia. He he got kicked out of Australia because he stole a church there. So that was <laughs> an interesting character. Um, yeah. Okay. And so yeah, you do have um, the called Zima Zion Evangelical Missionary Association. I think that's the name, and they've got missionaries from the states here in South Africa, and they wear the uniforms. So there's two branches of Zionism in South Africa, or two main types of Zionism in South Africa. One is called the Zion Christian Church, and they wear the khaki military-style uniforms. They're mainly in Limpopo, but they're all, they've got branches all over. And they've got two branches, the Dove branch and the Star branch, because I think it's two brothers that fell out over who should lead it. And so they separate. And then you've got the Zion Apostolic Church. And the Zion Apostolic um, movement, they wear maybe white uniforms with green and blue. And um, they maybe use the Bible a little bit more than the ZCC. Um, but they, they've, they've got lots of different churches. Like you go into Zulu Homestead and they've got their own little church with like six members and one pastor there because everybody wants to be a pastor. <laughs> but they, they are, they do have their hierarchy. So there are bishops over them as well. Um, so you'll have like a pastor, uh, like Umfundisi, a teacher. And then above him is the president, Mangameli. And then you've got bishop. So there's a very strong inclination to extol titles and um, position in, I think, South Africa, really across the world. But um, you see it here as well. Like, so, okay. So you're ministering there. You take them to the word of God, where they come to understand what's really going on. And they come to the faith. How then do you disciple them? What's the next step? So, um that's my follow-up so i've not had like to be honest like the number of people that have actually responded to my preaching has been minimal um but we had like in freyheit and we had a small church there that was planted by a couple who were in south africa that i was with caleb and sophie messi and so i was with them supporting them and the church was started in 2004 so it's always been a small group of people the one guy he, pumalani he basically got saved prior to meeting us and it was actually jehovah's witness literature that convinced him ancestors was wrong really? and i think that's an important point because you know just because god uses something doesn't legitimize that thing i think that's important um the second thing is when he came to hear the gospel we showed the jesus film i i preached and he's like well i was baptized as a baby why do i need to be baptized and i said but you were not born again and saved and so he actually, from that, he turned up to every single meeting. I never even went to his house. And we, we discussed scripture together and we walked together. And if there were issues, he would ask questions. And if there were things that I didn't understand, I would ask him questions. And I think it's like that life together. You can't always have that with people if they're spread out. Like we were close by, so that was easier. There was another guy called Mkulu. I went to, so I used to preach in between homesteads for, a, I don't know if it was like a 20 or 30 kilometer radius around the local clinic. So every homestead of 99 or 90 something percent of the homes had at least one person that heard the gospel in that whole area. Hmm. And so in this particular area, I was preaching and this, these people came out and said, we've got somebody sick, would you come and pray for them? So I said, I'll pray and I'll ask God, but God will determine how he will answer. That was my um, answer to them. And I prayed and that guy couldn't walk that week. The following week, he wasn't like healed, but he was um, much, much better um, and uh, a lot more strength. And I didn't realize at the time, but he was an AIDS sufferer. 
and he hadn't taken his ARV medication. Oh. I don't know how long, but he picked it up again and went from strength to strength. And so we had this conversation and I dealt with ancestors and I could see his face was downcast and he was like really troubled. And I just told him to pray about it. And the following week when I went there, he was bright, smiling, and he turned around and he said, um, the Lord, like he had a dream. And in the dream, God told him what that preacher told you is true. And then later I find out why he probably had the dream is he can't read the Bible. He's illiterate. And I tried to teach him to read. And I think maybe he has um, learning difficulties because um, I couldn't really teach him. But he went and told his neighbor, this older guy called Mkulu. Um, it's, his name's Daniel, but we call him Mkulu, which means grandfather. And um, he said to him, ancestors are wrong. And, and the guy said, where does the Bible say that? Mm -hmm. And so he came back to me and he said, where are the scriptures? And so I wrote the scriptures down and he took them to that guy. He started coming to our church. And then he, eventually he said, I've decided I've, I've left the ancestors now. And I said to him, that's wonderful. We need to do that, but that doesn't get you to heaven because only Jesus gets you to heaven. So you have to embrace what Jesus has done for you to go to heaven. And so it wasn't that long after that, that he ended up um, repenting. He came out, um, I went to pick him up for church and um, he said, I can't come because there was some issue, but he says, I've, I've decided to follow Jesus, to commit myself to Jesus. And I said, when did you decide that? And he said, this morning, I said, have you prayed and asked the Lord to save you? And he said, no. I said, would you like to? And he said, yes. And so we got down on our knees there and then, and I prayed and he prayed. And from that, we started doing, I think we were already doing Bible studies in his mud house. Um, and, and he's actually in the Allegiance film. He plays Hamilton's grandfather, who's the Inyanga. That's him. And his wife plays the Sangoma. Um, and she didn't like our Bible studies there. When we were there, we'd suddenly see her rushing out of the gate, like getting away. Uh -huh. And we prayed for her. And then I don't know where she is at the moment because um, since he, he passed away during COVID, but it wasn't COVID. People don't really know what it was that he passed away with. But they said at his funeral, um, our friend Kalani, she said at the funeral, people in the community were saying that we saw the change in this person's life. Wow. But it's like you walk together and there's issues that bug him. Like he went to a funeral and he was like, you know, I don't know if the meat sacrificed to ancestors or not, so I don't eat it. And I said to him, well, that's great. But I said, but you can like not ask, but if they tell you, then don't eat. It's the same 1 Corinthians 8 to 10. And sure. so, you know, you can see like the Lord did that work in him. And I, I've got a ministerial friend in, in South Africa called Alan McKenzie. And he put it really nicely. He said, as ministers of the Lord, we are witnesses. We bear witness before men. But he was also saying, but we bear witness of God in men. That there's this aspect that we cannot change anybody. That it's the work of the Lord in them. But the Lord uses our hands. So there's a kind of a paradox that the Lord uses us. But it's not us. It's, it's him working through us and aside from us as well. And so there's this part that you actually also stand back and you're watching as well as communicating. Now, I, I want to backtrack for, for a moment uh, on, on a question of, um, I'm going to say shamanism. You're describing the person and what they become, is, which I would say is equal to the idea of a shaman here in this part of, uh, part of the world and, and other parts of the world, frankly. Uh, and I was, uh, when I was at Paganicon 2023, I was in one of the workshops put on by a shaman, and they said, uh, you don't choose shamanism, it chooses you. And I yeah. went, okay, this is kind of the same thing you're describing. And yeah. one, one, of, one of the individuals that is currently making a huge impact on the evangelical church in the U.S. is uh, Claudia Naranjo, whose religious persuasion tends to be, guess what? shamanism so from coming from south africa what would you tell the evangelical church in the west to do with the the enneagram specifically that comes from the shaman how would you tell them to address that 
I would say, like, if you're really getting into something and you're promoting it big, big time, you want to know where it's coming from. And so you need to kind of investigate. I think it might be true in the States. I don't know. But here in South Africa, it's almost like Christian movements are like um, sweet stores. You pick and mix what you want. And so, like, you had um, when Emergent was big, you had emerg people doing Emergent here in South Africa, but they wouldn't call it Emergent. They were just doing stuff that was Emergent, probably not realizing the source and the stream. And so, you know, once you start to realize this is actually the worldview that it's rooted in, and it's not just that it's tangentially related, you know, like with physio, you might do certain movements in physio that's the same that you do in yoga, but the context is completely different. This is actually from that root and it's carried on into the church. And so it's the kind of thing that, you know, do you want to do something that actually it, God's treating you, going to see you as an adulterer? Like you're having a relationship with him and then you're having a relationship with this other spiritual power that's that's informed this thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually touching a, an actual demon, but the root and the source of it is demonic. But there are certain things, I think, in modern culture that, you know, maybe they had pagan roots originally. Maybe they didn't. But in contemporary society, they you wouldn't see any particular connection. And I think that's important as well, that you actually see the context which something is in. So there's something called the, the Enneagram is not just in church, it's in secular psychology. And it and the, the worldview behind it is the same thing that's being paraded in the church. And so, I mean, I don't know too much about it, but from what I've watched from you, it's, it's not a different thing. It's not, um, you know, this is the true thing and the Enneagram is the the, the, the the, the false counterfeit it's the same thing it's one and the same right well the, the enneagram i i just in brief uh those who are advocated really assume they don't state it this way but this is how it plays out assume that god doesn't really say enough or if anything about who you are as a person and how you should behave that's just absent from scripture that's a dangerous place to be i think <laughs> that's the thing uh, right and, and so they're turning is... to this which was channeled by automatic writing by a shaman that is highly dangerous mm -hmm. uh and yet they're just embracing it as though it somehow uh is giving them a spiritual understanding that they cannot get from scripture so taking this from the south african context and it would apply there is you know that when that guy said to me from my mother's womb i was zionist i said to him okay that's the case but the bible says you need to be born again and that there is a time and a place where we get um convicted and we actually get convicted of sin and we realize that christ had to die for me personally and i re i respond in faith to him so the, Paul says, you once were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. So you need, so when we get saved, we are new creatures, and, but we still have the old man attached. And so what we're learning is to walk like the new man, to think like the new man, to talk like the new man. And I think that's the same thing as it is for you know, discovering your personality. The Bible says a lot about what your identity is, but it's say, stating what your identity is in Christ. And really not what your identity is in Christ, but who his identity is in you. Like Paul no. says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And so there's a Jesus focus, not really a self focus. It's not like I need to know myself um, better. The Lord, if, if I see the Lord and I stay in the light, I will come to know myself because he will expose myself. Um, but he will remedy all those things that are actually contrary to him, and he will replace it with the things that are of the spirit. So I think the issue, I, I think that's the same, whether it's ancestors, homosexuality, um, this kind of personality profiling. I think the, the most important thing is to recognize that the person that we're born with is not the person we should be today. We should be the new person. And so if we're still seeing ourselves as that person, 
I think it, there's a problem there. It's almost like the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa made this kind of announcement in, I think it was 1997, and they said, you can be homosexual as long as you don't um, practice it. And, you know, <laughs> Rosaria Butterfield, she puts it really well. The issue of identity is central, that your identity should not be in sexuality or how you're tempted, but your identity when you get saved is in Christ. And um, there was another lady, um, young girl, she put it this way. She was a lesbian. Now she's married, got kids. But she said it's not gay to straight. It's lost to saved. It's the whole thing of Christ is my life and he is my all. And so my identity has to be rooted in him. So Christ in me, the hope of glory. That kind of yeah. Colossians 128 and 29. <laughs> Which, yeah. So... Mm -hmm. Which takes me back to something you said pretty early on about the culture in which you're ministering as their identity is prior to faith is grounded in what repeat that from an african point of view and it would probably be the same with um certain afrikaans families as well your identity is rooted in your family it's rooted in your roots it's rooted in the earth is it's 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 earthy and so like john and smbt i'm not stating him as a authority on what we should believe but he did describe african culture um well um and he basically said <laughs> african culture is about the past not so much about the future there's not that much eschatology in african traditional religion whereas for us everything's yeah, about the right. future <laughs> yeah I mean, it's Even not where salvation we come from, is about the future. <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's interesting because we have, of course, the 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 media, uh, predominantly liberal media, is like having fits over some of the laws being passed in uh, various African nations against homosexuality. Mm. But you're pointing out something that they are totally missing is the African ethos or their view of who they are is not rooted in their behavior, but rooted in the roots of where they came from. Yeah. So they're not saying like they, they, you've actually I think it was Mr. Vaney was saying, we know it's been there. There's been homosexuality there. But this homosexuality here is a Western import because it's a homosexuality of identity. And that's what makes homosexuality different to other types of sexual sin is like when you're an adultery, you don't say I was born this way. You know, it's not there's no ontology around adultery. Maybe some people will try it, but I think most people do it and feel guilty if they get caught. Whereas with homosexuality, it's like this is who I am. And so if you reject homosexuality, you're rejecting me. With, with an African culture, they're saying that's a Western thing. That's not African. African, you, you, there's an expectation you're going to get married. You're going to have children. In fact, one guy actually said to me that we should commit um, sexual immorality outside of marriage because the Bible says be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, yeah. and, if, and, if, and if you get married and your wife, <laughs> I'm talking traditional culture, she doesn't give you children, you take another wife. It's it, the whole thing of having children is very central to African culture. Um, and so that's why homosexuality, they, they made a stance against it, Africa's against it. And the West thinks, no, that's them being influenced by the West, Western <laughs> colonialism and Christianity. But actually, well, in a sense, there is that, but it, it does that, happen, but that's not it, right? Well. It, it, it what the whole biblical emphasis was imported by missionaries, but it found resonance with yeah. the African Americans society. tend to be Americans but, tend to be so parochial about their own culture that they have no clue, no clue whatsoever that other cultures sometimes look at the world in such dramatically different ways than we do that our way of looking at it is almost unintelligible. In fact, if it weren't for our cultural influence you know they might not be aware of how different we look we look at the world but like i have one example that is um japanese culture is extremely homogeneous to the point where that's a value 
that's a cultural value mm -hmm. conformity being like each other diversity is like what is that mm -hmm. it's yeah. like we don't yeah. not only do we not have that we don't want it we don't need it keep it away from us which yeah. uh, there's a proverb a famous japanese proverb the nail that sticks up gets hammered down so mm -hmm. you know if you if you so one day i was uh, i was explaining to somebody i was in middle school christian middle school education and i was explaining to the chairman of our school board <laughs> that um uh when uh when one of the people who was assigned to go to japan to study why is japanese education doing so well this is back in the 80s after a report came out a nation at risk report about our k-12 through education so this guy was sent by the by the government to go to japan to find out why they're succeeding. And he says, I knew the moment I got off the plane while they were succeeding. Everybody's alike here. Everybody's the same. There, you don't have to uh, teach to multiple kinds. You don't, have to, you don't have to worry about Hispanics, African-Americans. You don't have to worry about, e we were talking about Ebonics back then, learning to talk like black people as a language. You don't have to worry about all these challenges because everybody has a, a, everybody's on the same page culturally really simplifies things in terms of education. I was telling this to um, the, the the chairman and he goes, oh, I, I would never say that to a Japanese person. They'd be offended. And uh, I said, are you kidding me? They'd be, they would take that as a compliment. That's their cultural yeah. value. We would be offended if we said everybody's alike here. Well, I think as well, uh, that's the challenge of the gospel. Um, that the gospel has to be rooted in all these different cultures and different groups and and our identity in Christ supersedes that it challenges it challenges in every culture but and then again yeah. there's points of contact yeah between the gospel I, and the culture definitely and that's yeah. where i think the points of contact are are to be utilized but um you know it's got to be the we lose it if we don't if it's not the Bible yeah. above everything. Like when you, were talk, think... when you were talking about how they're very earthy, you know, I, my mind was going to 1 Corinthians 15. You know, the first man was of the earth, earthy. Yeah. <laughs> the second man is of heaven. And and it's like, this is where 1 Corinthians 15, I would think, you can tell me better than I would know, would be a, a, a place where the, the culture you're dealing with is challenged. African culture is challenged 100%. by that passage. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15 is dealing with Greek culture and worldview that believe that that which is physical is inferior and that which is um, right. intangible is superior um, and taken to an extreme that becomes Gnosticism. But in yeah. that kind of context, they find the whole thing of a resurrect, physical resurrection incredible. Right. So you, you have to deal with that. But, you know, I, I, I kind of put it this way. When you get saved you die with christ and your culture dies with christ but when you get when you get saved you're not just dying you're resurrected as well and so you're raised to newness of life and your culture is raised to newness of life there's a redemption that happens with the culture but the culture is fundamentally shifted because the worldview that informs the culture is fundamentally shifted and so there will be a dis distance between you and the other people in your culture. There should be, um, because you you go to a different rhythm, a different beat. It's not right. the beat of the worldview. It's the beat of Christ. And so I think, you know, that's where we really have to emphasize the whole thing of being born again. I was asked by a family. So we lived in um, Pumalani's homestead. We had a house built there. And across the dirt road, there was a farm and an our family was staying there. And we visited them once. And the the wife asked me, what are you? And because my mum is Portuguese Chinese and my dad's white English, so I'm mixed race. So she said, are you, do you see yourself as Chinese or Portuguese or English? And I said, I'm a child of God. And, and there's a fear in South Africa amongst um certain Afrikaans people that there's going to be a big uprising from amongst the blacks who are going to um, turn on the whites and slaughter them. And then um, afterwards, the Afrikaner will turn back to God and they will get their land back. And so I said to them, mm. if anything kicks off in this country, I stand with my brother Pumalani and I stand with my brother Johnny Mentz, who's an Afrikaans farmer. 
that's that's so what i'm saying is that fight is not my fight i stand with the body of christ and i think what we do is we make an idol out of our own cultural or national identity right. and we put that number one and then we put the other things number two and i think you know the early church i mean the church at antioch you had simon niger you had someone from cyrene you had jewish people and proselytes yeah. They're all mixed together. And that's the way the church should be. It's like Jew and Gentile want a Messiah. And that cultural difference is not just a normal cultural difference. The Torah observance of those Jews that was that was rooted in scripture, not necessarily all the rabbinic editions, but rooted in scripture is a God-given culture. And yet when Paul came with a God-given culture, he did not impose that culture on us, Gentiles. We are free in Christ and we're accepted on the right. basis of not right. conversion to a different culture or religious entity and so it's like that's the way the body of christ should be so if that's the case with a god-given culture we look at our cultures in the west and and they're somewhat biblically informed but the whole church with the steeple that was imported into south africa is not in the bible you know there's certain what? things what <laughs> it's not in the bible and wait let me have... look here <laughs> just kidding <laughs> There was a saying historically that becoming a Christian is to put white man's clothes on. And that's 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 had a detrimental effect. I mean, I've come across people in rural um, KwaZulu Natal <laughs> that they say women should not wear trousers. And you say, but what, why can't they wear trousers? And it says, it's because it says- I take, I take it, I take it clothing clothes. is, I take it clothing is very connected to identity in, in that culture. Can be, yeah. yeah, but it's kind of that's just a Western import, and so I said to them, "Okay, so I can take her trousers, and then you can wear them." And he said, "No." I said, "Why?" Because they're women's trousers. I said, "Exactly, they're women's clothes." <laughs> I mean, nobody in biblical times wore trousers anyway. Right. Oh, they might have had. Um, if you're if you're from the Celtic, if you're from the Celtic people, some of the Germanic people, but not Romans, that was considered barbaric. So. <laughs> Or, or 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 childish or you know little children might wear like or, or barbaric children maybe a barbaric combination. children children bar yeah. yeah you know what um i have really enjoyed this we could go on for a long time i am fascinated by what we're talking about we'll have to do this again because i think it can be challenging especially to those of us here uh, i i have said and ron and i have talked about this a lot that based on where we're currently at in our culture uh, it took uh, 300 years for Christians to transform society into what we know as Western culture. Mm. It has taken roughly 200 years for the pagans to return the favor uh, and repaganize culture and large portions of the church at the same time. So how do we then operate in America in our evangelistic outreaches and in our discipleship? And I think we have something we can really pick up from talking with you and others who are already doing that in a different culture so um ron would you care to walk us out of here i would care to do that let's give credit to whom credit is due our resident cult leader profiler is neil before me our wardrobe manager is see how it fits you culinary services are provided by chef ham and cheese our tinfoil hat provisioner is just in case Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and D Opposer, our Mormon Archives Manager is Polygamous. Our Liberal Denominations Chief is Lucy Goosey. Our Transgender Issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Special Correspondent for Cults Based on the Hindenburg Disaster and Flying Turkeys, Oh Dehumanity. Our Fact Checking Supervisor is Joling Pulling. Technical Assistance comes through Murphy Research. Our Legal Advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our Grievance Resolution Director is Giovanna Pisamini. Our Director of Privacy Insurance is Wiretapping. And Original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manager Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for this content, although you, you excuse me, will never be able to prove that in a court of law. Never, error, never, error. never, never happen. Okay. All right. So, Salvador and uh, all those who joined us, uh, appreciate it. We will uh, see you all next week, and you can see us next week, so. Yes. Thank Blessings. You. Thank you.